So if you didn't see it yet, um, it's up on the assignment page for the, the pre-lab. But Monday is the lab session with the MHL. I'll have you guys split into the two groups up here. Um, the plan is for group one to go at 9 a.m. and group two to go at 10 a.m. If you're not able to make the exchange tonight, yeah. I actually have a class at 11. At 11? Yeah. Um, so it would be better if I could drink. Okay. Let's see what we can do. So from 9 to 10, she work with you guys? Yeah, yeah, it's just the bus getting Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, is there anyone else up here in that's in Lab 1 at 9 a.m. or Lab 2 at 10 a.m. that can't, can't make that time slot or has some other conflict? I, I don't know if Andrew cares. He's not here yet. Andrew Tui, but okay. he's in the same class I'm in. Okay. Um, all right. He, he might not, though. Is there anyone in group one that would be okay if moves to group two? No? No. All right. We've got enough <coughs> wiggle room here. on Monday at the MHL. Uh, speak up now or you know just before Monday rolls around because uh, I'd like everyone to be able to participate. Um, have you guys had a chance to look at the at the pre-lab? I was just wait, I'm just confused. What was the first group that were just up there? Oh I just uh, some people weren't able to make Certain times, so I was just switching individual people around. Oh, okay. That, that's where, like you're still in the uh, right. the I'm ten a.m. group. The same. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Are there, uh, I wanted to ask, um, we didn't get a chance to go, like, to, to kind of walk through the exam uh, last lecture, <coughs> but like, with the, uh, the the optional exam corrections that's posted up on, on uh, Canvas, are there any questions on specific exam problems? I think if you all look at them, uh, You'll notice that the, the last problem, uh, I think it's kind of on me. Maybe I probably wasn't quite clear in what I was asking for when I asked for the, the governing equations. Um, and so you'll notice I, I wrote, there's a lot of like scratching out and stuff of grading because I went through those ones like two or three times to, to try to be fair and consistent. Um, but uh, with that problem in particular, since um, the grading is kind of a mess. Uh, I just wanted, I just wanted to, uh, be, for, for the sake of transparency, say that uh, what I was looking for was the idea that the flow is governed by Navier-Stokes and continuity. Right? If you write those out and cancel out the appropriate terms, you've still got governing equations, but they're simplified. And so without actually doing any solution, without integrating anything or, or, or performing any mathematical operations, 
it is I want you to take the simplification of the governing equations as far as you can to make the simplest possible problem statement. Um, in that case, just write out Navier-Stokes, write out continuity, cancel things out so they can't cancel anymore, combine them if you can, and what you should end up with is just a, a, a homogeneous second order ordinary differential equation, which most of you then went on to solve, which is fine. Um, just uh, as long as you wrote out the, showed the work that showed that you did cancellations and stuff, you got full credit. But um, if you didn't, you know, if you didn't uh, go through the steps of cancellation and write out the governing equation that you were actually solving to get the, uh, the velocity distribution, then uh, unfortunately you had to take some points, but I tried not to be too, too brutal on the grading for that one. So today we're getting into the beginning of our last, uh, beginning of the end here, the beginning of our last chapter, which is on external flows over bodies. Um, in the last chapter we talked about viscous flow through pipes, what we call internal flows. Today we're going to talk about flows over things like plates and spheres and cylinders and ships, right, where the where the flow is unbounded on one side. It's, it's, it's up against a boundary, and then off into infinity. And uh, that's the definition of an external flow. So we're going to be describing some of the characters of external flow, and then I'll be introducing uh, and sort of motivating boundary layer theory. Uh, we were not probably going to have time to get into the exact laminar solution for the boundary layer equations today, but uh, that will be what we... Uh, pick up with on um, Wednesday after the lab. So, um, in general, you know, as I said, an external flow is one in which the body, your solid body, whatever you're considering, forms one boundary of the flow and then the flow goes off into infinity or, uh, or at least a long ways away. It's not confined between <coughs> two surfaces or between or in the inside of a pipe or something. So um, in, in, in kind of everyday parlance, this means that we take a body and we submerge it into a flow. Uh, the fluid in question could be air or water, which is why we have you know, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, depending on whether the flow is air or water. And uh, there you know, good practical external flows of interest that we deal with every day are things like flow over a car, uh, flows past building structures, and uh, flow over airplanes. Usually, we're interested in, a, this video shows a wind tunnel testing of a semi-truck, but usually the things we're interested in when we consider, consider external flows, um, you know, th th there are cases where we're interested in the exact, you know, the, the flow visualization, the streamlines or streak lines, um, <coughs> the flow over objects, but more often we're just interested in the gross kind of integral quantities, things like lift, drag, um, and, and, and the forces that are experienced by these objects, basically. How big of an engine do I need to put into this semi-truck to get it moving down the road at 60 miles an hour? Um, the thing is that, that these quantities, lift and drag, are hard to get without some insight into the details of the flow around an object. Uh, and so, usually, for external flows, um, we're forced to uh, perform either experiments or very high level simulations because there's no set of equations that you're going to be able to solve for the flow around this by hand, right? There's no external, or no um, exact solution um, that you're going to be able to do on homework nine that's going to give you the flow around the semi-truck. Um, so we often use either physical models or high level numerical models to determine the flow visualizations and the flow fields around a wind tunnel, and from that information we extract what we need to know the pressures and the shear stresses and come up with the forces that are acting on a body. So uh, this is kind of review for you here. Um, you know, there are a couple of differentiating quantities that we, or differentiating characteristics of external flows. Um, they depend strongly upon the geometry of the body that's immersed in the flow. 
and including you know how the body shaped, but first is the number of dimensions that describe the body and its flow. So just as before, we talked about 1D, 2D, 3D axisymmetric flows. Um, we could talk about two-dimensional axisymmetric or three-dimensional bodies. Uh, 1D bodies never, they don't really exist, you know, so we're going to leave those out here. But uh, two-dimensional bodies and associated flows generally involve the, the cross-section of a extremely long or nearly infinitely long body with constant sections. So uh, something like if we were to consider a slice through a telephone pole, something where the length of the body is extremely large compared to the diameter, uh, then we could probably fairly treat the flow around that piece of the telephone pole as a two-dimensional flow. That is, ignore flow along the, long, or the length of the pole. Axisymmetric bodies are formed by uh, a body of rotation. That is, if you have a two-dimensional body and you rotate it around its line of symmetry, uh, something like a sphere or this bullet or ogive shape are good examples of axisymmetric bodies. And we can analyze these in much the same way as a 2D flow, right? Because we're saying that as a result of this axisymmetry, um, there's no change in the angular uh, coordinate. And so if we look at them in cylindrical coordinates, we can say the, the, lo the longitudinal coordinate, or x in this case, and the radial coordinate may change, but the angular, uh, the angular coordinate holds no change. And then finally, uh, three-dimensional bodies are any of those that we can't describe using lines of symmetry or constant cross-sections. They may possess a line of symmetry somewhere, but uh, but in general, we require three x, y, and z, or r, theta, z uh, coordinates to fully describe the body. So, uh, this first <coughs> video of a kayaker is kind of useless, but this is a good example of, uh, of the three-dimensionality of flows that result around complex shapes. This is uh, one of the space shuttles coming in for a landing, and as it hits, touches down, um, all the smoke that's generated by burning up of the wheels here, you can see forms into these wingtip vortices. So it's, a, it's an example where you have these um, flow over a, over a body, right, over the front of the, the uh, shuttle, and then these really complicated flows that look nothing like the space shuttle itself uh, occurring oops, off of the edges of the wings once the, uh, right, which is, uh, and, that, and that follows from um, <clears throat> three-dimensional wing theory, which is not something we're going to have time to get into uh, in this class, but if you watch again, you can imagine that there's probably streamlines moving over this, but what you don't expect <coughs> is to see this sort of spiraling motion off the edges of the wings, um, and that's an interesting byproduct of, as I said, 3D wing theory. So uh, we can ask ourselves what causes the forces that we're interested in, right? If we're interested in lift and drag um, on a body, then where do these come from? And the short answer is uh, stresses, right? Stresses are force divided by unit area. And so if we know the distribution of stresses on a body and we integrate over the entire body, then what we get are forces. And these stresses generally occur in either normal directions, that is, pushing against or pulling on the surface of interest, a small element of a surface, or they occur in tangential directions. They, they uh, occur along the surface. And so these two components, the normal stresses generally come from pressure, and the, the tangential stresses come from shear distributions. So the, uh, the, the ability to exactly predict what the forces on a body are going to be in a flow boil down to our ability to predict exactly what the pressure and shear distributions on the body look like, uh, which is a lot easier said than done, because as I said, uh, <coughs> we can't, there, there's, we have the equations, the governing equations of Snabius Stokes, we just don't have the ability to solve them for general arbitrary flows. So, uh, <coughs> the pressure, you know, if, we, if we're clever, we can often trick trick the analysis and the thinking that we can apply the Bernoulli equation and such, and we can get some good estimate of the pressure distribution. 
Shear distributions are harder because we need to know the exact uh, the velocity gradients everywhere in the flow in order to get shear stresses. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is kind of understanding how people have been dealing with uh, the predictions of shear and pressure in these really complex flows where we don't have the ability to solve the equations that we've derived for them. Um, all right. So this kind of uh, uh, leads us into what we talk over what we call boundary layer flows. Uh, and boundary layer flows are sort of the tool or the, the concept that we use to understand uh, where the different stresses come from and where they're important in a flow. Uh, if you remember, the Reynolds number can be thought as, or can be thought of as a ratio of, um, we'll say this is um, representative of the ratio of <clears throat> Inertial forces the vis viscous forces, uh, which means that one of the uh, the one of the major uh, dominant characteristics of external flow uh, is going to be the Reynolds number because it tells us how much of the flow is going to be dominated by viscosity and how much of it is going to be dominated by the fluid inertia. So um, it would probably be useful if I made up a little list here. Uh, the importance of the body shape. Uh, and then the forces that dominate in the body, as I said, um, if we were to perform a, a dimensional analysis, what we would see is that in general, the, the some character of an external flow right, is going to be a function of a bunch of the, the dimensionless groups that we came up with before, the Reynolds number, the Froude number, the Mach number, the Euler number, et cetera, et cetera. We know from experience that the most important of these are the Reynolds number, and in cases where there's a free surface, Froude Fruit number, in cases where we may have cavitation, we're interested in the Euler number, or sigma, and uh, in cases where compressibility is dominant, Mach number. It all depends on looking at the flow and saying, like, what, what's the most important thing here? Um, in this case, we're going to ignore the we're going to say there's no free surface presence, so get rid of the free number, and we're going to assume that um, the f there's no cavitation present, so we don't need to worry too much about the cavitation number, and then we're going to go ahead and continue to assume incompressible flow, so the Mach number stops being important. So this means that the, the only uh, dominant remaining dimensionless parameter that <coughs> affects the fluid flow is this Reynolds number. Okay. So, um, because of this insight that we have about the inertial forces and viscous forces, uh, we can say that the Reynolds number will, in general, if the Reynolds number were r equals zero, this means that the fluid has the the the, the, the viscous forces account for 100 percent all of the forces present in the fluid, right? The only time we have a Reynolds number of zero is when the fluid's at rest. You know, it's not moving because there's no velocity that goes in the uh, goes into the numerator here. Um, or if they were looking at the uh, something with a characteristic length of zero, something like just a fluid particle itself. Okay, but the um, 
And on the other, the other end of the spectrum here, if the Reynolds number is equal to infinity, this indicates that the <coughs> viscous forces virtually disappear. Okay, that we're really only interested in uh, inertial components. Okay, something like an inviscid analysis. Um, in reality, no fluid flow that we're interested in reaches either of these um, extremes. It's going to fall somewhere between the two. We're going to have some finite Reynolds number that tells us what the character of the flow is. And so, more often, we're interested in is the Reynolds number much less than one, which would indicate the viscous dominated flow. Or is the Reynolds number much greater than one, which indicates it's an inertia dominated flow? So, um, what these different types of flows look like are shown in these uh, plots here on the left. If we have a really small Reynolds number, something around 0 0.1, uh, the, the, the body that we're considering here is a flat plate. We'll say that it has uh, effectively zero thickness. Okay, so we're not, we're not going to worry about the, the, the size of the body too much or its, or its streamlining. Let's just say that it's a, it's like a really thin sheet of metal. It is a surface with no thickness um, of length L. So if using this length of the plate as our length scale in the Reynolds number, uh, then with the Reynolds number 0 0.1, this indicates that uh, because it's significantly smaller than one, that we expect the flow to be dominated by viscosity. And what this means is that uh, there's a fairly large region of the fluid um, in which vis viscous effects are important. Uh, because we have this no-slip condition at the plate, right, it's going to slow down the flow uh, in what we call the boundary layer. We'll be talking a little bit more about that in a second, but um, this, this retardation of the, uh, the inflow velocity um, occurs over a very large portion of the flow domain so that you have to move far away from the body in order to experience the free stream flow, in order to get out of the region where the viscous effect of the plate is felt by the fluid. Um, another consequence of this is that at low Reynolds numbers, you'll notice that the streamlines here are sort of deflected around the body. And uh, the reason for this is, if you remember that uh, when we're talking about streamlines, what happens to the spacing between streamlines when a fluid slows down? They get closer together, further apart. This is a really useful insight to know when looking at flow visualizations. Remember, flow doesn't cross streamlines, so we can sort of treat streamlines as artificial walls, right? So if we have streamlines, <coughs> there's flow between streamlines as well. So if we have two streamlines here, shown as these black boundaries, um, and we have some velocity, a uniform velocity field upstream, and then we have some reduced velocity, that is, u2 is less than u1 downstream, then how do, what, what do we have to do to the spacing between streamlines in order to satisfy continuity of mass, or con conservation of mass? We've got this u1 a1 is equal to u2 a2, right? <coughs> Which tells us that a2 over a1 has got to be equal to u1 over u2. Meaning if u2 is significantly smaller, then a2 has to be significantly larger. <coughs> so these streamlines have to get further apart in order to maintain conservation of, of mass. Higher speed, streamlines move closer together to keep the same amount of fluid flowing between them. Further apart, stream, uh, the velocity is slowing down. And so in boundary layer flows like this, if you look at a flow and you see near a body, streamlines sort of moving apart from one another, that's an indication that 
uh, there's some change, reduction in the velocity. Um, and so in, in low Reynolds number flows, where this re slowed down portion of fluid is really large, you're going to have this significant deflection in streamlines, even fairly far away from the body. Okay, so now uh, if we increase the Reynolds number by two orders of magnitude up to a Reynolds number of 10, we get this reduction in size of this viscous region. Okay? In other words, if you start at the body, you don't have to go nearly as far away from the body to reach a fluid that is um, basically uniform velocity field that looks like the upstream flow. Um, and then at the extreme uh, value here, uh, 10 to the 7th, right, we've gone up 7 orders of magnitude um, to about 10 million, you're going to have this really, really small region of uh, viscous effects. So, um, in other words, starting from the body, you only have to travel a little bit up or down to reach undisturbed flow, and behind the body, the only portion that is uh, feeling viscous effects is what we call this wake region, which is uh, the part immediately downstream. In other words, these viscous effects get created and convected downstream. So, as a little... Uh, as a little <coughs> exercise here, if we assume that the viscosity of water, the kinematic viscosity is 10 to the negative 6 meters squared per second, um, and a typical flow of interest, maybe 1 meter per second in a flow velocity, um, just on your respective notepads, figure out what body sizes, what, what, what L's would be required to attain Reynolds numbers 0 0.1, 10, and 10 to the 7th. <coughs> Since these are, these are, um, this is generally true of water at most temperatures, and one meter per second is a very typical flow speed that we would see um, in experiments or even some low speed vessel operations. So, uh, what'd you guys get for um, a body length to get a Reynolds number of about 0 0.1? 10 to the negative 7. Reynolds number of 10.
10 to the 7th. 10 to the 7th. All right. So um, if we kind of look at those numbers and we say, just by order of magnitude, we say, all right, we know this to be approximately the viscosity of water. We know this to be, you know, 1 to 10 meters per second is probably a typical range of speeds that we would see in operation of vessels, which means that, um, you know, of those, of those numbers, 10 to the negative, uh, 10 to the negative 7th, 10 to the negative 5th, and 10 meters, which one is the most realistic scale of a, of a, of a ship or a marine, you know, device that we're going to be operating, right? 10 meters, that's, that's, that's a very normal uh, size of something that we'd be designing to operate in, in a sea, in a marine environment. Which means that for us, <coughs> these are really of academic interest, right? These low Reynolds number flows are not something that we encounter very often in our, uh, in, 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 as naval architects. The other thing I want to point out, it's sort of built into this, but um, I want you guys to understand that the Reynolds number here can be varied either by changing the length, like we did, right? If we look at increasingly large objects, or by increasing the velocity. So we could fix the length at say one meter, and in order to get a Reynolds number of 0 0.1, we would have to have a velocity of 10 to the negative seventh, and a velocity of 10 to the negative fifth, and a velocity of 10 meters per second in order to retain these Reynolds numbers. So um, low Reynolds numbers require small velocities with small objects. Higher Reynolds numbers result when you have larger objects and higher velocities. And uh, so we get these kind of nice insights into um, if we've got here on the x-axis the length of a body or the the characteristic length that we're using to judge and the velocity and the, the velocity of the fluid um, in air in in dark and in, in water in red we can see sort of the characteristic range of Reynolds numbers. So uh, our most likely range of operation is going to be sort of between. From, of, with lengths of probably about uh, maybe not usually smaller than 10 centimeters if we're talking about something like a small control surface, hyperfoil or propeller blade, 10 centimeters would be about as small as we go. Um, let's say 10 centimeters per second it would be probably the smallest velocity we're likely to encounter of interest. And so our Reynolds <coughs> numbers are going to range from about 10 to the fifth upward. Um, meaning that we've got these high Reynolds number flows to worry about mostly. And so in, here in a, in, a, in a couple slides, I'll talk about why that's important. Um, so uh, that kind of describes why we're concerned with uh, the different dominant forces and speeds and different portions of the flow. Uh, the other consideration is what we call streamlining. So um, this kind of goes along with both uh, of, the, of the previous topics when it talks about the shape of the body and the dominant forces. Uh, but before, talking about something like a flat plate, right, the idea here is this doesn't, this plate itself doesn't disrupt the flow at all. If we say it has zero thickness, it doesn't displace the fluid around it, it doesn't cause the fluid to move around it, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it basically it looks like a streamline. Right, so this is what we would call a perfectly streamlined body, as opposed to something like a cylinder, which we call a bluff body. This is something that causes the fluid to displace itself significantly in order to, uh, to accommodate the presence of the body itself. So, um, and, and flow around a, a, a circular cylinder or something like this is uh, particularly interesting uh, and, and deceptively complex type of flow because it involves, we have to consider the shape of the body, it, its sort of non-streamlined character, and what comes from that, we have to consider the dominant forces on the body, and as a result of those two things, we have to consider this effect that we call separation. So let's go through these uh, sort of one at a time. If we're looking at really small Reynolds numbers, something in the order of 0 0.1, like before, then this tells us that the flow around the body is mostly dominated by viscosity. As a result, the presence of the body here is felt upstream, downstream, way up to the sides, and uh, it flows this small. Every fluid element, basically, its, its inertial component of force is, is pretty negligible. 
it's going to try to stick to the body, it's going to be <coughs> getting pushed and pulled around by fluid viscosity, but the flow over the front and the, the, uh, over the forward and aft portions of the body is going to be relatively symmetric. So really small flows, these are what we call subcritical uh, Reynolds numbers, will actually have something that looks almost like a potential flow solution, which is a little bit weird considering potential flow ignores viscosity and this is viscous dominated. But um, at higher speeds or with a larger body, right, if we crank up the Reynolds number to something around a Reynolds number of 50, what happens is this portion of viscous dominated flow shrinks to um, probably about one, one diameter upstream and out to the sides. And uh, what happens is that now fluid inertia is more important. And as a result, the fluid has trouble tracking the, the surface of the body. It can kind of be thought of as uh, that's a simple analog. If you're, uh, you know how if you're, um, if you're driving a car over a hill, right? There's the idea that uh, the radial acceleration You're in a, I don't know, car driving over a really bizarre looking hill here. Um, it has a radius of curvature of r, and you're driving with some velocity v. There's the idea that the, um, to, to remain on the hill, there's this radial velocity, a radial uh, acceleration of v squared over r. It's required to keep this car stuck to the ground. Um, and so, um, at the same time, uh, at the same time, the only acceleration that's keeping you stuck to the ground is gravitational. And so you have to ask yourself, is this V squared R less than gravity? If so, the car will remain stuck to the ground and wheels remain in con contact. However, if it becomes larger than gravity, then basically that means there's, you're not accelerating downward quickly enough to remain not airborne. And so the car will come off the ground. So um, it's not quite the same um, mechanism going on here, but it can sort of be thought of the same way. As the flow speeds up, it has more inertia and requires a greater amount of energy to keep it stuck to the surface of the fluid. Um, that energy and that work that you would usually keep it stuck to the fluid comes from pressure, and unfortunately, the effect of viscosity here is to steal some of the energy from the pressure potential energy and dispose of it through thermal dissipation. And so um, there isn't enough potential energy remaining here to keep the flow attached, and what will happen is it'll, you know, fly off of the, the fluid here and form what's called a separation bubble, or region of recirculating flow. So um, this is something that happens with bluff bodies, right? When you put a bluff body into a flow, it causes the fluid to have to deflect significantly around it, and when that occurs at moderate to large Reynolds numbers, uh, the bluff body then, the fluid is not able to stay stuck to the bluff body and you end up with what's called a separation uh, region or a wake region behind the body. So this is kind of the, the meeting of the body, importance of body shape with the importance of viscosity and the, the interplay between them. So, um, at higher Reynolds numbers, what you're going to get is this Again, you're, this confinement to a very small boundary layer uh, around the body. In other words, the flow behaves almost in an inviscid fashion. Uh, it has the same velocity as approximately, or the velocity gradients out here are approach zero. And inside of the boundary layer, we have this, uh, uh, this region where viscous effects are very important. But we still have a separation region. And so we're still going to have this large wake region where the flow separates. We get this crazy eddying flow that then convects downstream. <coughs> and we end up with what's called a von Karman vortex street in some cases, if it's a cylinder, or just this really random uh, <coughs> wake component. So um, So again, um, 
just to, to reiterate, we've got the, uh, the importance of body shape. This would have been reiterated here because it, it, it tells us uh, something about how much deflection the, 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 the streamlines are going to have to make to get around the, uh, the body. Uh, dominant forces, again, important here. And in this case, a special uh, consideration of body shape that deals with streamlining is important uh, because for streamlined bodies, we will not have this flow separation, and therefore we won't have this wave region. Uh, whereas with non-streamlined or bluff bodies like this, we almost always have a region of separated flow. And this is one of the reasons, um, this is a, a major loss in energy, right? You, all of this eddying flow requires a lot of kinetic energy to, to be sustained. And that kinetic energy essentially comes from the pressure potential energy in the fluid, meaning that flows like this create a lot of drag on an object. Um, on the last homework, you should have, or not the last homework, but the homework previous, um, dealing with potential flows, um, you should have, there, there was a problem dealing with some, uh, a body that looked like this, right, in a, in a fluid. It was the, the forward half of a cylinder, and it said treat treat the flow over the front of the body as if it's a if it's, as if, as if it's a sphere or a, a cylindrical body, and over the back assume so here you calculate the pressure distribution and here assume a constant pressure distribution, um, and the uh, that this is a, a sort of. A, a simple way of approximating the flow over uh, the separated flow over a cylinder, and what you should have seen in that problem was that the flow over the front of the body actually created some small amount of uh, suction force, that the flow over the back of the body created this huge suction force here, um, which resulted in a large drag component. This is one of the reasons why you don't see very many airplanes with circular wings. Okay. Uh, in fact, there's a really dramatic visual. I'm not sure if I can do it. I'll, I'll try to find it. I'm not sure if I can do it justice drawing it by hand. Um, but the idea is that bluff bodies, because they have this separated flow, require a lot of energy to move through the water. So if you were to take a small, like you know, something like a something like a um, a, a baseball, okay, um, and move it through water, some velocity u. Okay. The amount of drag experienced by this is the same as is this is the same drag experienced by a we'll say that the um, the length scale on this is length equals the diameter which is equal to about 10 centimeters okay or 0 0.1 meters um, this is the same as the drag experienced by an airfoil section, or a a well well designed <coughs> streamlined section moving at the same speed, with a length of I don't want to take a guess how much bigger this can be than this to have experienced the same amount of pressure drag. Two meters. Five meters, so a characteristic length of almost 50 times the size. So if I were to draw this to scale, this would be something like this, this little dot and this body here. If we ignore the skin friction, <coughs> friction is important, friction will drag on this is going to be a lot larger, <coughs> but if we deal with just the pressure component of drag, that which is ca causes the resistance in this wake here, um, we can drive uh, a body that's, you know, one to two orders of magnitude larger through the water with the same amount of force as a, as a bluff body. Okay, so um, we've, we've, we've established that the shape of the body is important, uh, whether it, that, you know, in defining whether it's 1D, 2D, axisymmetric, 3D, uh, the shape of the body is important because it tells us how much streamlining the body experiences, and then the Reynolds number is important because it tells us where and by how much the inertial versus viscous components of the forces are dominant. Um, we've also shown that for all the flu flows that we are usually consider considering as, as fluid dynamicists and, and naval architects, uh, we're usually concerned with Reynolds numbers that are fairly large. 
meaning so um, for naval arcs, Reynolds numbers are almost always greater than 10 to the 4th or 10 to the 5th. Okay. Large inertially dominated flows. Um, now this was actually, so this led in 1904 to um, this proposition by a guy named Ludwig Prandtl, who is my favorite aerodynamicist. Everyone should have a favorite aerodynamicist. Um, and he said, you know, aerodynamics, they also deal with relatively large Reynolds numbers. Uh, the kinematic viscosity of air is actually a little bit larger than that of water, but um, they operate at much higher speeds, and so if you look at the Reynolds number, they usually operate in the same range. Okay, but um, he suggested that, he's the one that proposed this idea of a boundary layer. It's something that we kind of take for granted now, the, the notion that um, there's this boundary layer, a layer of fluid that's stuck to a body that's getting dragged along with the body. However, he kind of came out and he said, look, we have the Navier-Stokes equations. Those had been discovered earlier or derived earlier in the 1800s. That we still, we've been trying for 100 years to solve them. We haven't gotten anywhere. Let's try something new. And he said that, he proposed that um, for high Reynolds number flows, the re area, um, the, the region of the flow in which viscosity is important is confined to a very small layer near a solid boundary. Right? He, he's, he's the one who first proposed the no-slip condition, that the flow along a body where it's immediately adjacent to the body has to have the same velocity as the body itself. It sticks to the body 100%, it doesn't move relative to the body, and as a result, the velocity will match the body's velocity at this point and increase as you move away from the body until it matches the free stream velocity. Uh, so, in other words, where we have this velocity gradient between the body velocity and the free stream velocity, we're going to have viscous effects because the viscosity is some product of the velocity gradient or some function of the velocity gradient. Um, a nice way to visualize this is if we imagine we have this upstream flow, uniform, and we just put two kind of particles in here. Uh, let's imagine these are the same fluid elements that we talked about at the beginning of chapter six when we're discussing fluid kinematics, right? Ones that may experience translation, dilatation, rotation, shear, deformations. And we track these two fluid particles as they move the fluid. This one remains in the external flow everywhere. And so it, all it's experiencing is translation, right? The, the fluid, the, the, the velocities it sees are all uniform and constant. And so it remains the same shape and it moves by the same amount every time step. The one on the bottom here, once it enters the boundary layer, the fact that there's this velocity profile here and this velocity gradient causes the shear deformation that increases, increases, and then at some point, um, at some point right here, or, well, I guess it's already drawn here. At some point right here, the Reynolds number becomes large enough that um, the boundary layer goes from a laminar boundary layer to a turbulent boundary layer, which means that it's no longer just rotating, it starts getting thrown around and mashed up and uh, this fluid element, um, its motion becomes much more chaotic. So uh, this idea of the laminar to turbulent boundary layer, we talked a little bit about laminar and turbulent boundary layers and pipe flow, but we talked about it as, you know, we said that the Reynolds number for a pipe flow be equal to uh, UD viscosity, and we said <coughs> that it's laminar less than about 2100 and turbulent when greater than about 4000. Okay? Um, but this, for purposes of this chapter, I want you to get that entirely. We're going to say here for Reynolds numbers, we said um, this is equal to u times some characteristic length over viscosity. And in fact, we showed before that um, 
the boundary layer equations are, there's, there's some mathematical justification for this. They're what we call parabolic equations, which mean that it's essentially the information only moves downstream. So the flow here does not see the flow here, and the flow here does not see the flow here. Basically, information can only get carried with the flow in a boundary layer. Um, and this is a mathematical uh, interpretation. But what it means is that um, we can essentially take this L to be some changing distance down the, uh, from, measured from the leading edge. So if we measure from the leading edge to be x, then the flow at some length here, right, if we say this is, we define this as our length, then um, if we just kind of snip out the rest of this flow downstream, then uh, the flow over this first L distance of the plate is going to be exactly the same as if it were a plate that is the, the same length but has nothing downstream. Um, the reason we do this is because we can now understand that um, for a given inflow speed, the Reynolds number now increases along the length of the plate. In other words, it becomes a linear function of the distance along the plate. And for uh, flow, or external flows, we generally say that for Reynolds number of less than about um, 5 times 10 to the fifth, it's a laminar. And Reynolds numbers of greater than about 5 times 10 to the fifth, you know what, I'm going to say, um, actually, this is about 5 times 10 to the fifth. <clears throat> Below 10 to the 5th, it's usually laminar. Above 10 to the 6th, it's usually safe to say that it's turbulent. Between these two, right, um, in the range of, in the 10 to the 5th range, uh, it's transitional and it depends a lot on things like the surface roughness and the size of the body and the amount of curvature. But um, the idea here is that if you have a given body, uh, at the beginning of the plate, the, pl the flow is always going to be laminar. The boundary layer will always be laminar. Um, and as you move down the plate, down the plate, down the plate, your local Reynolds number is increasing, increasing. At some point, you're going to go above whatever your kind of critical Reynolds number is, and your laminar flow will end, and you'll, be get to get, you'll start to get this transitional flow, where it becomes, starts becoming more and more turbulent. And as you increase Reynolds number more and more, you hit this turbulent Reynolds number, and the boundary layer transitions to turbulence. And we'll talk about, um, next week on Wednesday, the details of laminar versus turbulent boundary layers, and we'll solve the boundary layer equations. <laughs> so, quick reminder, um, for Monday, look at the pre-lab, uh, and, and go through and make those uh, thrust predictions for the eight different, um, the eight different operating conditions on the barge. Okay? Uh, so, the, where, where are we meeting? To the lab? Uh, sorry, to the lab. We're meeting uh, at the NHL. So, yeah. Well, um, so you know the, uh, kind of by, right by Ulrich and Swiss Royale there, the arch? Yeah, the way you can is the door in the arch. So if you just meet us meet at the arch, basically, we'll get the line.